John chapter 6. Preach this morning on the ain't nothing better than Jesus. John chapter number 6, verse 35. John chapter 6, verse 35. Nobody's ever made the claims Jesus made. Nobody's ever impacted the world like Jesus did. Nobody's ever had the influence over people that Jesus Christ had. Out of all the billions of people that have walked on this planet, He has more influence on more people than any other one single human being. I'm glad to be His servant this morning. He's my brother, even though He's a king. Uh, He's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Best thing that ever happened to me was meeting Jesus. You're never the same after meeting Jesus. You never are. I've not been all I could have been. I've not been all I should have been. But I've never been the same since I met the Lord Jesus Christ. He changed me. He changed me. The Bible said if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. So listen carefully this morning as I read you the Scripture here in John chapter 6 and verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Quite a statement, isn't it? And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. What a statement. Buddha never said nothing like that. Muhammad never, ever even come close to making a statement like that. Muhammad never told his followers, I'm the bread of life, and you come to me, you'll never hunger for anything else. Well, that's, that's preposterous. That's ridiculous. For a man to say something like that, unless he is who he said he was, the Son of God. This is, I found out this morning, long as I've been living, that whatever you need, he is. Now think about that this morning. Think about that this morning. Whatever you need. Somebody said, boy, I tell you, I just need some things in my life. Well, I know what you need. You need Jesus. Somebody said, well, I'm having trouble with this. You need Jesus. Somebody said, well, I'm not happy here. You need Jesus. Happiness is to know the Savior. Living a life within His favor. Having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. I didn't say Jesus had the answer. I said He is the answer. There's an empty spot on the inside of every person in this world. don't care how famous they are. I don't care what kind of act they get in, on TV and put on and act like they're cool, got it all together, and have no, no burdens and no problems. There's an empty spot on the inside of every person in this world that only Jesus can fit. Amen. Like you ever had uh, trying to take a bowl off and uh, get a wrench? Somebody say you need a five sixteenths. Somebody else said you need a half inch. Somebody else say you need three quarters. And you try a bunch of them and finally you get the one that fits. That's the way the Lord is. People try drugs, people try alcohol, people try a life of sin, and nothing don't fit. And then one day, somebody preaches to you. You get under conviction, walk down to an old-fashioned altar, get down and repent, and you find out He is the answer. I've been in revival meeting now uh, for two weeks, and last night was the first night I had preached, and, and in two weeks, about 15 times, in the last few weeks, and so I about strained my vocal cords out a little bit. But I got to thinking, how could a person talk about something this big and wonderful and not scream? I was going to do it. Uh, a lady asked me one time, we went to visit her, and we were trying to get her to come to church. She said, I'm going to ask you one question. I said, what's that? She said, do you yell when you preach? I said, oh boy, she's not going to... Yes, ma'am, I do. She said... Okay, which is a stupid question, really. That's a stupid question. Do you yell when you preach? Well, what do you, what do you mean? Do you, you know, do you move when you walk? Sure, you do. That's a, that's a dumb question. Of course you yell when you preach. That's the meaning of the word. And uh, I said, yes, ma'am, I do. How could we have something as good as Jesus and not yell about it? They yell about car races. They yell about... Uh, spinning that wheel and, and getting a lucky number. When a, if you want a thousand dollars, would you? Would you? Somebody wants something. You said, "Here, I'm gonna give you a thousand dollars." You say, "Thank you very much. I'm thankful in my heart." No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't.
I'm not. So I'm, you say, well, what would you do? Try me this morning. I'll show you what I do. Hey, walk up to me after service and say, Brother Danny, I know you got some bills to pay. Here's your thousand bucks. I go, yes! Woo! Thank you, Jesus. That's exactly what I do. Amen? And I got something a lot more than a thousand dollars. I've got my name in heaven. I mean, the Holy Spirit's my comforter. Jesus is my Savior. God's my Father. I, I, my sins are gone. He don't even see them. When He sees me, He sees the blood. I'm telling you, buddy, I am got something to shout about. Amen. And there ain't nothing better than Jesus. We had 11 nights of revival this week. I'll tell you a little bit about it. And over 20 people saved. I, I'm going to tell you about some things that happened. You can have more fun in the Lord than you can anything else in this world. Uh, the other night I was preaching. And when I got through preaching, there was a lady who sat on this side of the church started crying. Matter of fact, I don't always notice it, but I just happened to look over here and saw her crying while I was still preaching. I looked at her and uh, just kind of scanned the, the congregation like I am right now. And she, the longer I preached, the more she cried. And I said, God, maybe I should just hush right here and give the invitation while, while she's ready to come. But I, I went ahead and finished. And I said, all right, anybody need to come? Son, she hit that altar. And boy, that she hit the altar. She had two or three little girls with her about that tall. And, uh, and she cried. A lady took the Bible, led her to the Lord Jesus Christ. She got peace in her heart. And so they took her in a, in a room in here and talked to her for a little bit, made sure she understood. Preacher brought her back out there. said, ma'am, do you want to say something? She said, yes, I do. She said, I've made peace with God tonight and all that. I mean, she was, you look, you know, like she'd been around the block time or two. A uh, tattoo on her leg there. And, and, uh, but, and she said, the Lord has, has, has forgiven me of all my sins. And boy, I'll tell you what, her, uh, when service got over with, when service got over with, her little girl who was about that tall, about eight, eight or nine years old, she come running up to me. I'd never seen the kid in my life. And grabbed me around my waist and hugged me. She said, I want to get saved. And I said, okay, honey, you can get saved. And I told one of the ladies, I said, well, you talk to her. She took her in the pastor's office. And about that time, there was a man come in that they had out in the parking lot. And he said, this man wants to get saved. And I said, Amen. They went up there to the altar. I mean, it was it was like the old days when when they're getting saved in the parking lot and getting saved in the back of the church. And he got saved. Uh, I think his name was Don. And we prayed for Don. And old Don looked pretty rough too. I mean, you could tell he is a sinner. Well, the next night or two, there's some other old rough-looking boys showed up, and they sat in the back. And uh, we all come walking in halfway through the sermon. There's about four of them come walking in. And they sit back there, I mean rednecks. They, they looked up at me. I thought, Lord, there's a pulpit committee. Uh, but, uh, no, no. <laughs> and they said, I said, no, that ain't what that is. I guarantee you that. Bunch of old rough guys. And uh, I shook their hand. One of them, uh, uh, they, they told me, one of them's name was uh, uh, Billy Ray. Billy Ray. Isn't that, isn't that fun? So, you know, you, you'd think that was on like a movie or something. Billy Ray. And they sat back there to come back the next night. They sat on the other side. And uh, that night, boy, I preached hard. I mean, I, I, the whole sermon was, you ought to get saved tonight. Tonight, tonight, tonight. And I gave my testimony. Tell how I got saved. And boy, it got good. And the Lord started moving. And I said, all right, let's give the invitation. And them boys stood back there. And Billy Ray turned around and walked out. Walked out the door. Out the door. And I went, ah, the devil told him. See, when he started, you know, when they come out, I had a man tell me one time, he said, uh, he said he wanted to go to the altar every night and get saved. And he said, what I do is, he said, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And he said, when he gets out here to the altar, the devil says, turn left. And he goes that way. He says, I always plan on going to the altar. And he said, when I get out here, the devil says, turn left. And goes, uh, I said, well, just sit on the other side. <laughs> And they may said maybe the devil will mess up and you come up this way. I don't know. Uh, but, but anyway, he turned around and walked out the door, man. And when I when I and about the time I got through, here he come walking back in. And the, and what it is, he couldn't stand it without a cigarette. You couldn't. I mean, a man like that that's hooked real bad can't stand over an hour and a half without a cigarette. So as soon as the invitation started, he had to go out and smoke him one. And so I talked to him a little bit and. Uh, he had been drinking. He wasn't drunk, but he, you could smell alcohol on his breath a little bit. And uh, so the next night, they all come back. 
And I preached again. And this time, God moved in strong. And that night, we dismissed again. There's out in the parking lot. Somebody else got saved. Somebody else got saved. And about that time, the preacher come walking in the back door, had his arm around Billy Ray's neck. And said, Billy Ray wants to get saved. And I said, hallelujah. And boy, they brought him in there. And Billy Ray done and got saved that night. And boy, he, he had a little alcohol on him that night too. Uh, but I tell you what, he was back the next night, cleaned up. I mean, he had shaved. He had put him on a clean shirt. And Billy Ray, and I'm going to tell you what they found out. They found out that there ain't nothing better than Jesus. I got excited the other night, and I don't always do this, but they have, you ever been to a church had one of them little fences up right here? I don't know what they're for. That little fence all the way across here. I said, I don't like what you has got that fence in here for. I feel like I'm a little dog and you got me fenced out. And I'm in the, out here barking at you or something. And, uh, and so one night I got real happy and I got to tell them about what the Lord had done for me. And I got, I got to shouting and run around and it got real to me. And you know, when it gets real to me, I'm just, I'm looking for something to climb or jump over or, or, or something. And boy, I took off like that and jumped over that little fence. And there was two, they had been trying to get visitors out. There was two ladies there that night that was not used to that at all. There was, one of them was a Presbyterian preacher. Woman, Presbyterian preacher. I did not know it. I did not know it. They were sitting right there about where Missy sat. Raise your hand. Right where she's sitting right there. Out on the second row. This was the, the, the aisle here, the, the thing. Well, I, of all that big church, I picked right there at that spot. I jumped over that thing, hit one foot right here, and the next foot right here, and I was right in their face. And they, they had never been, they had never heard nobody pray. That, can you imagine a woman Presbyterian preacher? <laughs> And they'll say, let's go to this Baptist church and enjoy this. And the guy jump over the, over the seat and get in your face and start screaming. I didn't even know it until the service was over. I said, the Lord put me on that old gal. Amen. And, and loaded her wagon. I don't know what she thought about it, but she didn't come back. So I guess... I guess she got all she could handle that night. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what, when it's all said and done, kids, when you've done been everywhere and done everything, and you've tasted what this world's got to offer, sooner or later you're going to come back and say there ain't nothing better than Jesus. There ain't nothing can satisfy you. Nothing will help you when you lay down to go to sleep at night. He'll be your best friend. He'll walk with you. He'll talk with you. And thank God when it comes time to die, He'll carry you on the other side. Hallelujah! There ain't nothing better than Jesus. And I'm glad I know Him this morning. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right, You want to see me swing on the chandelier? Look out, boys. I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I don't know if I can make it from here. That's what I want to do. I want to just jump right here and grab that one and do a gainer, get a hold of that and back yonder, and then go to the other side. Thank God. You know why? That there ain't nothing better than knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm telling you what. But he, listen, there were some ladies there Friday night that their church was having revival, and they missed it and come to our revival. <laughs> I said, oh, boy. They said, well, we didn't want to go to ours, Brother Danny. We wanted to come over here. I said, well, uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to say praise the Lord. But because that ain't right. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something, buddy. We had a great time. We had a great time. The kids got on fire. They got out in the canvassing, they called it. You know where we'd say going out and giving out fire? They said, we went out canvassing. And uh, I've never heard nobody say it like that before. This one girl, she is so on fire for God. She's about 18 years old, just getting ready to start her first year of college right now. And, buddy, she is on fire. She's out there just inviting her friends, inviting her. Nothing, nothing will satisfy a teenager any more than really getting on fire for the Lord and then bringing your friends to church. Ain't nothing like it. There ain't nothing like it. There's nothing in this world like going there. People say, well, if I just had money... That's what we're taught nowadays. If you just had plenty of money, you could be happy. But the truth is this morning that most people who have a lot of money are not happy. Now, I'm sure I'd like to have some. I mean, you'll give me some. Sure. Hallelujah. I'm sure I wish God would make us y'all, all of you in there. But if you think that's going to make you happy, you're wrong. Never has made a man happy yet. Somebody said a miser isn't much fun to live with, but he sure makes a great ancestor. Amen. 
Uh, money has a way of getting a hold on people. Money can't buy real love. Money can't buy real happiness. You spend, you spend the first part of your life getting money and the second part of your life trying to keep other people from getting it away from you. That's all money is. All it does is buy you a bunch of stuff. And the stuff can't make you happy. You have to worry about the maintenance on your stuff. Now you say, well, I'm going to buy me a big boat. you got to pay somewhere to store it. you got to pay somebody to clean it. you got to worry about nothing wrong with having a boat. I hope you got one. I don't care. But have you ever noticed the more stuff you get, the more you got to worry about it and worry about it and worry about it. I know some old grandmas up in Spruce Pine who sit there in a little old house and don't own, don't own a boat, don't own a car, sit there every morning out on the porch and read their Bible, and the Lord sat right there beside them just as happy as a lark, brother. You know what? Because there ain't nothing better than Jesus. They said back in 1923, the world's financial tycoons met to have a big meeting. Among those who were present was, was people like Richard Whitney, who was the president of the New York Stock Exchange. Charles Schwab, who was the president of a steel company. Uh... Albert Fall, who was the president's cabinet, and, and Jesse Livermore of Wall Street, Leon Frazier, who, uh, who uh, was a great financial wizard back in the 20s, Ivan Kruger, and all of these men. You know what happened to them? The greatest, richest men in America. They said that Charles Schwab died broke. Richard Whitney it was president of the New York Stock Exchange, wound up in Sing Sing Prison. Albert Fall wound up in prison. Jesse Livermore, I think, wound up a suicide. Leon Fraser wound up a suicide. Ivan Kruger wound up a suicide. Four of those guys, three or four, wound up putting a gun to their head and ending their life. And the truth is that all of us know people who financially were well off. I know some myself personally from McDowell County had everything. Some of the richest people you know took a gun. But there, you know why? There is something about money that once you get it, you don't have it. It has you. And it gets bigger than you are. Nothing wrong with it. God, Solomon's a rich man. David's a rich man. I mean, hallelujah. Nothing wrong with it at all. God bless you with a lot. But it will not satisfy the deep Deep longing down in your soul. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing is better than Jesus. We're talking about education. Education cannot satisfy you. It will not, cannot, will not satisfy you. One of the gods of America this morning is education. But somebody well said, education without salvation is damnation. It will not satisfy you. Somebody else said drugs. You know, the Beatles come out years ago, and they say, well, I'm going to get high with a little help from my friends. I'll get high with a little help from my friends. And they're talking about that dope. And they start saying, we all live in a yellow submarine. That's a big old pill, big yellow pill. And uh, they're all saying that. And they thought, man, we have found the answer. Drugs has hooked us into the, the, the spirit world. And they got hooked up with them old gurus from the Far East and all of that stuff. But the Beatles wound up. John Lennon got his head shot off up there in, in New York. George Harrison died the other day. Ringo had to have 16 bottles of beer every day just to make it through. Oh, a pitiful alcoholic. Paul has got deceived by demons and can't even eat a hamburger. Amen. Right, he's a vegetarian. He thinks it's wrong to uh, kill a cow and eat it. And anybody believes that's a hypocrite because they kill cockroaches. And if cows have right to live, cockroaches have right to live too. Say amen right there. He I can't stand this hypocrite. And you know what? Oh, Paul, uh, he found out that, listen, brother, there ain't nothing better than Jesus. Nothing better than the Lord. Drugs can't satisfy you. Drugs are like a grasshopper, young people. You can go way up, but you've always got to come back down. And when you come back down, your problems are there waiting on you, even magnified and bigger than they were. Alcohol cannot satisfy you. I know people that say, well, if I can just get to the liquor store Friday evening, I'll get loaded up, man. I'll tie one on and I'll be happy. You realize this morning that there are millions, millions, over 10 million alcoholics in the United States. Some of them feel like the only friend they've got is in that bottle. 
live from week to week just to get another drink. And I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, this morning. It will not satisfy you. Beer won't. Alcohol won't. Whiskey won't. It gets little by little by little. gets a bigger hold on your body and on your mind. There is nothing better than Jesus. Some people think relationships. You know, it's the current the word nowadays. Well, I'm not in a relationship right now, which means I'm not shacking up this week. And check back with me next week. That's what they say. I'm not in a relationship right now. That's a nice way of saying I have temporarily quit whoring around. And, and uh, 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 amen, most of the time. Not always, most of the time. But uh, if you're in a good relationship, that's fine. And you're right. Amen? Preach, brother. Now listen, you know what? Uh, th- somebody said, yeah, that's why them people on TV, that's why country music singers are never happy. They'll write one song and say, I have found you. And I fell in love with you. The first time I ever saw you, I'll never be sad again. You, you're all, everything I want. You're everything I want. Check back with them on their next CD. Next CD comes out six months later. You ain't what I thought you was. You let me down when I was lonely. There's a tear in my beer. Where my woman, she got my heart. You got my ring. She got my heart. I yell, oh, just shut up, man. Shut up. You need Jesus. That's what you need. You need Jesus. Amen. Amen. Somebody said, well, if I could just find that special person, I would be happy. Yeah, and I know who that special person is. Yeah. His name is Jesus. Yeah. Listen, ain't you got it figured out by now? I'm not against you having a relationship. I think, I think God wants just about everybody, just about everybody, to be married and happy. Just, it's 99 out of 100. That's God's plan for your life. There's nothing wrong with you meeting someone, falling in love, getting married. That's God's plan. But if you think that's going to make you happy, then you're greatly deceived. Because there is not a person in this world can meet the need of your soul like Jesus. Somebody said, well, I just married the wrong person. If I was rid of him and found me somebody else, I'd be like, no, you wouldn't. Because a person can't make you happy. It's only Jesus. They might temporarily thrill you. They might temporarily thrill you, but they ain't going to make you happy. Sooner or later, you're going to come down and say, hey, I need something more. I need a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's right. Not only that, religion. You ever seen anybody try to be happy just by being religious? Doing good deeds? Lord have mercy, what a miserable life. Somebody said, well, I'm trying to do the best I can. The best thing you can do is come to Jesus. If you ain't done that, you ain't doing the best you can. One man said, well, I'm doing the best I can, preacher. Have you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and fell in love with Him? No. Well, you ain't doing the best you can then. That's the best you can do. That's the best thing a man can do. The best thing you can do is not give your body to be burned or give all your, donate your organs or whatever. That ain't the best thing you can do. Somebody said, well, I really feel good about myself because I'm going to leave my liver. You're going to leave your liver anyway. <laughs> you ain't going to take it with you, crazy. Listen, listen, brother. What? That ain't nothing. You want to die? <laughs> I never thought of that before, but there'll be no livers in hell. So deceiving are the dead, empty religions of this world. Cults provide slavery while they promise liberty. Religion is man doing something for God. But Jesus and salvation is God doing something for you that you can't do for yourself. Teenager, there ain't nothing better than Jesus. Mama, they ain't nothing better than Jesus. You say, well, I'm just having trouble getting along with my family and all that. I know what's wrong. Your relationship with Jesus is not what it ought to be. You say, well, Brother Danny, me and my husband fight all the time. Should we go to marriage counselor or go see a lawyer? You should go to Jesus and say, Lord, help my heart to be what it should be toward my mate, toward my husband, toward my wife, toward my children, because there ain't nothing better than him. Nothing. You want to be happy? You want to be happy? A little song says, Happiness is to know the Savior. Living a life within His favor. Having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. You know where I put it one time? I was preaching years ago and it just come to me. 
Now, if, I, if a man or a woman, boy or girl, goes out hunting happiness, you never get it. You're, it's elusive. Happiness is something that's just always around the next curve or over the next hill or at the next party. You know, oh, we're going, man, it's going to be great. It's going to be. You ever notice that? And about the time you get it, moves on up. And about the time you think you've got it, it's like a, trying to catch a fish or something. It just squirts right out of your hand. And they spend their whole life chasing it. Chasing it. Well, let me tell you what I found out. One day, I got right with the Lord, and I confessed all my sins. And I come to the Lord, and I said, Lord, I've lived all these years trying to be happy. And I just realized that I don't deserve to be happy. I deserve to be in hell. God, because you love me and saved me, I'm going to live my time now just for you. It don't matter if I'm happy or not. It really don't matter. I'll be happy when I get to heaven. Here I'm just going to do, try to find somebody else and live for Jesus, try to help somebody. So I'm going down the road, and I'm, we're starting a bus ministry. We're bringing kids to church, giving them money, witnessing to people. Don't matter if we're happy. I ain't trying to be happy. Who cares? All we care about is living for the Lord. And all of a sudden, one day, you come in and reflect. <laughs> ah, oh, whoo, who are you, man? You've been riding with me for... He said, I'm happiness. I said, where'd you come from? I hunted you for years, man. Where was you? He said, oh, I just ride along with them that serve the Lord. I said, whoa, I found the secret of life. The secret of life is quit trying to make yourself happy. Give up your life. Do something for somebody else. And all of a sudden, somebody will just slip right up beside you. Now you've got to be careful right there. Because you say, cool, I love being happy. And then he gets out of the car. Wait, I'm not happy no more. And the Lord said, because you took your eyes off me and put it on happiness. If you put it back on me, happiness just slides up beside you. He says, here I am. I come to ride with you some more. In other words, you'll never be happy trying to be happy. You'll never be satisfied trying to be satisfied. You'll never be happy trying to make yourself happy. Happiness is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's in the Lord. I'm telling you the dying truth this morning. The younger you learn this, the better off you'll be. Thank God there ain't nothing better than Jesus. Some of you here this morning, you've got caught up in, the, in what we call the affairs of this life. And you're all tangled up. And I know it's easy to get like that. Cars, house, clothes, bills, money, things. I mean, it is almost impossible not to get tangled up in just junk and, and rent money coming in and going out. and Your car payment and your car tore up and you're trying to trade cars or you're trying to move. That's, that stuff just keeps you all messed up all the time. That's why I'm glad we can come to church on Sunday morning and get our eyes right back where they're supposed to be. And say, there ain't nothing better than Jesus. Your problem's not your mate this morning. Your problem's not your mom or daddy or your son or daughter. Your problem is get it right between you and him. And everything else will work out.